Good evening, Impact DMV Church. And I also want to say good evening to all the friends of our ministry. I'm so glad you're joining us once again for our midweek impact Bible study. I am so glad you're here. So go put your hands on your tools, get your notepad, your pen, your paper, your iPad, your iPhone, your, your Android, your Kindle, whatever you utilize to capture good notes. Go put your hands on that because it is my belief as I say every week that the sovereign God of the universe is going to minister to your heart this evening. And I want you to be able to capture whatever it is that he impresses upon your soul. And so we're in Romans, the seventh chapter, and we are looking at verses seven through the twelfth verse. This is part 43 in our teaching series of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Uh, the topic for this week is the same as last week. Is the law sinful or is the law sin? And this is part two to last week's teaching. Amen. So we're in Romans, the seventh chapter, and let's read verses seven and eight. Amen. Just back up a little bit and let's move forward. What then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yes, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. In this eighth verse, I believe that the Apostle Paul is addressing Adam, not addressing himself. Refer back to last week's lesson. Uh, I believe that he's speaking as if he was Adam and he's talking about Adam's experience in the Garden of Eden. Sin had no power or no dominion over Adam. Sin did not exist in humanity prior to the giving of the commandment. Before God gave the commandment in the Garden of Eden, Satan had no opportunity to even seduce Adam. But the, the giving of the commandment changed everything and Satan seized the opportunity to challenge man's love for and his obedience to the sovereign God of the universe or his creator. So through Adam's disobedience, like an adulterer, he rejected the love of God and he embraced sin. And so the covenant that was made with God was terminated and now man enters into a relationship with sin a relationship with sin that the law was powerless to change. Look at the seventh verse in that seventh chapter. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Again, who is this text talking about? Well, this text could only be talking about Adam because all men are born dead in Adam. All men are born dead in their sins and trespasses, according to Romans, the fifth chapter and the 12th verse. And so uh, no one since Adam has been born alive. So this text could only be speaking of Adam. So how is Paul using alive and died? How is he using these two words? Well, he's using it the same way he's been using it for the last couple of chapters. Go back to Romans, the fifth chapter and the 12th verse, if you would, Romans 5 and 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. The death here in Romans 5 is the same death that we read about in Romans 7. He's not changing tenses. He's not changing themes. He's speaking of the exact same thing. He's flowing from, just don't think in terms of chapters and verses. Just think of one letter being written and he's not jumping all over the place in the meaning of the words that he's utilizing. The words mean the exact same thing from chapter the chapter. So the death here is the same death that we read about in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. And so what he's saying here is that Adam was alive. And how was he alive? He was alive in his fellowship with God, with his creator. But then he sinned. And when he sinned, he died. And how did he die? He died in, in, in the sense that he lost his fellowship with 
uh, his creator. And so the death here is speaking of a spiritual death. And so we all died in Adam. So the apostle Paul cannot be speaking about himself because he was not alive apart from the law. Paul, just like you and I, were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And so keep that in mind. I want to read something here from John MacArthur. Um, Listen to what he says. He says, listen how personal Paul is, because he's assuming that the I in our text in Romans 7 uh, and 7, he's assuming that the I here is Paul, that Paul's speaking of himself. I don't believe that. I believe he's he's personifying uh, Adam as well as Israel. Let me start all over again. Listen how personal Paul is, and he's describing his pre-salvation experience. Prior to salvation, Paul was not uh, alive. So let me stop giving commentary. He says, when he says, I was once alive, he doesn't mean I was a possessor of spiritual life. He doesn't mean I was a possessor of eternal life. He's simply saying I was free. That is not what the text says. The text does not say that the Apostle Paul was free. The text says that the Apostle Paul was alive. He's speaking again about being spiritually alive. The Apostle Paul was not spiritually alive before he was converted. We are made alive in Christ. The Apostle Paul, just like you and I, was born in sin and shaped in iniquity and was in desperate need of a Savior, just like you and I. So the Apostle Paul, again, is not talking about himself. He's talking about Adam as well as referring to the children of Israel. Listen to this quote by Tom Costable, and he agrees with John MacArthur. Paul was relatively alive apart from the law. Relatively alive? Absolutely not. No one is ever completely unrelated to it. However, in his past, Paul had lived unaware of the law's true demands and was therefore self-righteous. Paul, just like you and I, was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. This text is not talking about Paul being self-righteous. That's not what the text is talking about. He was dead, just like you and I. Listen to John Piper. I was once alive apart from the law. That is, he once had little or no consciousness of sin or condemnation or slavery. He just did what he felt like doing. It seemed like freedom and felt like being alive. Though I have great respect for these men, these men have mentored me, um, though I've never met them personally, they've been my mentors, and I've learned a considerable a lot of Bible knowledge from them, I believe that they're wrong in this regard. They all know that the Apostle Paul was not spiritually alive, so therefore they have to make alive mean something different than what the Greek demands. We got to remember, I don't see, we don't see Paul here as talking about himself, Paul uses I as a rhetorical device personifying both Adam and personifying Israel. Paul here is personifying Adam's narrative, Adam's story. He's speaking of Adam being alive before he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But as soon as the command came, thou should not eat from this tree, eat of every every other tree that you want to, but don't participate of this tree, temptation presented itself and lured Adam to disobey uh, his creator, to disobey the command of the sovereign God of the universe. In verse 8, he's talking about sin seizing an opportunity. In verse 9, he's talking about sin becoming alive in him. And these are military terms. They're terms for the, the waiting in ambush. Paul here is talking about Satan. He took the opportunity to seduce Adam. This ended his fellowship with his creator and established humanity's bondage to sin. Look at the ninth verse again. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. While studying for today's lesson, I was looking through John MacArthur's 
uh, commentary and his commentary there on Romans 7 and 9, he says something that really challenged me. Uh, and I don't mean in a good way. It challenged me. And I, I just had to, you know, do a little study to, to, to figure out if this was true. He says this. True believers, even though they are new creations, and because they are new creations, have a built-in nature that despises remaining sin. And no matter how they would want to feel good about their spiritual progress, they continually feel like disappointments to God, hating the flesh that clings to that glorious new creation. I need you to know that you are not a disappointment to God. You are not a disappointment to God. We are in union with his son, Jesus Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees his son. Are you tracking with me? And so when God sees us, we are righteous, we are holy. We have perfectly obeyed the law. How have we perfectly obeyed the law? We've perfectly obeyed the law in his son. Everything that we've been talking about over the last several weeks, we've died in Christ, but we've also resurrected with Christ in the newness newness of life. And, and so we have been perfectly united with his son. And what is true of his son is true of you and I. If Jesus Christ have perfectly obeyed the law, you and I have perfectly obeyed the law. Please know that to be true. There are a couple of things that I need to say to you tonight. Just to reassure you of the fact that you are not a disappointment to God. One is that we all fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God knew that already when he created us. He knew we were going to fall short of his glory. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to settle our account. Are you tracking with me to die in our stead? He's taken our filth. He's given us the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He also knew that we would never be able to earn it. We would never be able to earn our justification. The Bible says in Romans, the fifth chapter in the eighth verse, look what it says. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, not when we were perfected, but when we were a mess, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us because he knew we could never be good enough to earn a right standing with him. Look at Ephesians, the second chapter, verses eight and nine. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, not a result of works, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God saved us by his grace, not by our works, because if we worked for it, then we would have something to boast in. I did this, but you could never be good enough. So God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He sent his son to die on the cross, to take the filth of our lives, to give us his righteousness. Are you tracking with me? And by his grace, we have been saved, not by works. So God knew that we would fall short of his glory. So therefore, he sent his son to justify us and to make us right with him. Number two, his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. Jesus says that his grace is more than enough to sustain us, but not only to sustain us, but to cover us. Are you tracking with me? Look at 2 Corinthians, the 12th verse, verse 9, the ninth verse. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yes, I boast in my weakness. I boast in the fact that I can't keep the law perfectly. But why am I boasting in my weakness? Because as I boast in my weakness, I am declaring my bankruptcy and declaring also that I am in desperate need of a savior. And I'm praising the fact that Jesus came and died for me, that he took my my shame and my my guilt upon himself and gave me his righteousness. And I'm boasting in his righteousness so that his power may rest on me. Are you tracking with me? And the only way anyone could ever be saved is the identification of their weakness. So God's grace is sufficient for me in my weakness. Also, look at Romans. The fourth chapter, verses seven and eight. 
Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Praise God. And whose sins are covered. Praise God. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. That's what the Bible says. Blessed means happy is that man. Happy is the man whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Happy is the man whose sins are covered. Happy is the man against whom the Lord does not count his sin. I'm not walking in shame. I'm not shame. I'm not walking in constant distance disappointment. Why? Because I know that he's taken my sin, that my sins are covered. My sins have been forgiven. God's not holding my sins against me. Are you tracking with me? I'm not walking in disappointment and neither should you. Uh, Number three, God's plan and purposes for your life cannot be thwarted. Are you tracking with me? Cannot be stopped. God will bring to fruition every single purpose that he has decreed for your life before the beginning of time. His purposes for you are not dependent upon you. Are you tracking with me? They're dependent upon his character and his nature and his power to bring them to pass. Are you tracking with me? And so God has everything worked out, even your failures. He's already worked it out. How? He worked it out by sending his son, Jesus Christ, that we don't stand before God in filthy rags. We stand in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And so all of God's plans for his righteous children will come to fulfillment. And so there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can think. There's nothing that you can say that will frustrate God's plan for your life. And let me tell you something you may not I have thought about. We are just not that powerful. We are not powerful enough to change God's purpose and his destiny for you and I. That is absolutely arrogant. And if you are that arrogant to think that you've done something that has changed God's plan, you need to repent of that. Are you tracking with me? Because because God has a way to bring you to a brokenness. And that the Bible says a broken and a contrite heart he will in no wise cast out. Uh, But I don't always like the way God breaks me. So I try to humble myself myself under the mighty hand of the sovereign God of the universe. So to think that you can stop God's plan and purpose for your life is absolutely arrogant and and, and it cannot be done. God will bring it to pass. Job 42 and 2 says this, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Can the church say amen? Next, the next thing I want you to know, is that God will get the glory no matter what. That God will get the glory no matter what. God will get the glory despite our visible imperfection. There has been a great exchange. Are you tracking with me? There has been a great exchange. Turn the Bible, turn your Bibles rather, to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, the the 61st chapter, verses 1 through the third verse. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now catch this, to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Do you see all the, the exchanges there? Beautiful headdress instead of ashes, all of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that we may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. God takes all our brokenness, all our ugliness, and he makes it something beautiful. Are you tracking with me? So that we may be seen as being strong and and being righteous. And when people see us being strong and, and standing in his righteousness, they glorify our Father who is in heaven. Look at Romans, the eighth chapter, the 28th verse. Get this in your spirit so you stop thinking that you are a disappointment to God.
God. Romans, the eighth chapter, the 28th verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things are working together for our good if you are in Christ. Are you tracking with me? The good, the bad, and the ugly is working together for our good. Are you tracking with me? So you don't have to feel as though God is disappointed with you. You don't have to walk in shame. We don't have to. Why? Because the Christ has come. And when he sees you, he sees you through the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Can the church say amen? Now, listen, God cannot be disappointed with anyone who has put their hope and trust in him. God cannot, let me say that again, be disappointed with anyone who has put their hope and trust in him. I got my concordance because, you know, like I said, that statement by John MacArthur, it, 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 it kind of bothered me. Uh, and I wondered if it was true. And I'm, I'm sure it is true for some believers. And, and so if we got bad theology, we, we think wrongly about God. Five times this word disappointment is utilized in scripture. And we are promised that if we put our hope and trust in the sovereign God of the universe, if we believe in him, we will never be disappointed. Now, let me give you these Bible verses. Uh, the word shame is the same word disappointment. The Greek word that is translated as shame is the same word that is uh, translated as disappointment. So uh, look at Romans 5 and 5. Look what it says. And hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not disappoint. Hope in who? Hope in God does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Look at Psalms 22 and 5. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame and were not disappointed. Look at Romans 9, 33. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, will not be disappointed. Look at Romans 10 and 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, will not be disappointed. Look at 1 Peter 2 and 6. For it stands in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To God be the glory. If we put our hope and our trust in the sovereign God of the universe and Jesus becomes our righteousness. Are you tracking with me? We're covered by the blood of Christ. He doesn't look upon. He chooses not to look look upon the fifth of our lives and he sees us through the righteousness of his son Jesus Christ he will never ever be disappointed with us are you tracking with me to God be the glory go back to Romans the seventh chapter if you would it says this uh, in the tenth verse the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me the commandments of the Lord were to protect our lives. Uh, we see this clear if we read it out of the Young's Literal Translation. Look what it says. And the commandment that is for life, this was found by me for death. The law was given to bless and to protect and sustain humanity. But through Adam's disobedience, humanity died in its relationship to the sovereign God of the universe. Man died spiritually. Originally, the law was to ordain, to sustain, to protect life. God made man perfect. God gave him a perfect life. God promised him a, a perfect life if he obeyed the law under the condition of 
perfect and complete obedience God promised man life but man rebelled against that law and with all the fury and all the power of divine authority the law sentenced man to death and the law became a jailer to him and threw him into prison now this is no different than state and federal laws as long as you respect honor and obey the laws the law is your friend it's your protector it sustains civilization but if you rebel against the law, you become an enemy of the law and the law becomes your adversary and the law would take hold of you and throw you into prison. Are you tracking with me? So complete obedience to the law brings life. It sustains life. But man cannot fully obey the law of God. If we could, it would protect us. It would be a blessing to us. It would sustain us. Are you tracking with me? That's why Paul says the law is holy. The law is holy. Look at Matthew, the 19th chapter. Go to Matthew if you would. The 19th chapter, 16 through 18a. None of us could keep the law. If we could keep the law, my goodness, we would be living in bliss right now. We wouldn't be dealing with all this crime. We wouldn't be, be dealing with this, this fallen creation that we all uh, are, are subject to if we could obey the law fully. It would have done what God designed it to do, to protect us, to sustain us, and to be a, a blessing to us. Look at, again, Matthew 19, 16 uh, through the 18th verse. And then we're going to read 20 through 22. And behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And then Jesus tells him which ones. Look at the 20th verse. The young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, Jesus being sarcastic here, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. No one can perfectly obey the law. And what Jesus is doing in this narrative here, he's using the law to point out this man's sin. And the reason why he walks away sorrowfully is because he couldn't see his own sin. And even when we evangelize, there's some people that, that they're just going to walk away from us when we talk to them about the truth of the gospel. Why? Because they won't see their own sin because they have not been regenerated. Are you tracking with me? We'll, we'll go back to our text. Go back to our text. Romans the seventh chapter let's look at the 11th verse it says for sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it it killed me the apostle Paul is not talking about himself in this text he's clearly talking uh, from Adam's perspective speaking of his experience with the serpent in the garden of Eden the word killed here is the Greek word apokteino. It is used 70 times in the New Testament and always of literal killing. Paul sees sin as a predator waiting to attack and kill. Satan saw his opportunity in Eden when the command was given. By enticing Adam to disobey, he secured the decisive victory that he wanted. He turned man against God and put him into a position of guilt before God, the one who loved him. Now go to Romans 7.12. Now this is where Paul answers the question that's being asked in Romans 7.7. 7. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law is far from being sinful. You hear me? The law is far from being sinful. The law is holy. It's holy because it comes from the sovereign God of the universe. It searches out sin. The law is righteous because it lays out God's righteous requirement for his people. And also the law is righteous because it forbids and it condemns sin. It cannot forbid and condemn sin and yet be sinful itself. It absolutely is not. 
the law is good because its purpose is to produce blessing and to sustain and to protect the people of the sovereign God of the universe. The law is holy because it expresses the character and the nature of the living God. Can the church say amen? So Paul is telling us that the law is holy. Are you tracking with me? The law is holy. And the problem with humanity, the problem is, is not the law. The problem, Paul tells us in Romans 8 and 3, the problem is the flesh. And we should know by now what the flesh is that the apostle Paul is talking about. He's not talking about this for sure. We'll talk about that when we get there. Look at Romans, the eighth chapter and the third verse. I do want to at least read this. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. God has done what the law can never do. Are you tracking with me? And what is it that God has done that the law cannot do? What God has done is that God has produced righteousness. The law could not do that. The only thing the law could do was identify our disobedience. It could not produce in us righteousness and God has done that by the sending of his son Jesus Christ. Oh, can the church say amen? So the apostle Paul has exonerated the law. The law. He's shown us that the law is holy, it is just, and it is good because it identifies for us our sinfulness but it also protects us God intended it to bless us and to sustain us but God never intended it to bring about righteousness in us he has done that through his son Jesus Christ are you tracking with me so the apostle Paul has exonerated the law is the law of sin absolutely not to God be the glory and so we're going to end right here and we're going to pick up Romans in about two weeks we're going to pick it up in about two weeks I, I try to do like six weeks seven weeks on depending upon how the lessons are going and then like two or three three weeks off so I'll take about two weeks off and we'll come back to Romans the seventh chapter and the 13th verse so start reading that 13th verse and beyond because you're going to be surprised of how much you already understand based upon what we've already taught you are you tracking with me amen so let's pray father i thank you lord Lord, I thank you, first of all, that you're never disappointed in us. You're not disappointed in us because of the righteousness of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, God has done what the Lord never could produce, Father, and that is righteousness, Father God. And I'm grateful that we stand complete in you, Father God, that we stand holy and perfect and blameless in your sight because we're in Christ. I'm so grateful for that, Lord. I'm grateful for the law. I'm grateful for the law identifying to me father my desperate need of you and then i'm grateful for you regenerating my heart father and causing me to cry out for him whom my sub my soul truly loves my creator father and my sustainer the sovereign god of the universe so father i pray now that you keep me in your care father that you help me to walk in obedience and to grow in you, Father, and live out the mandates of the kingdom, Father. May your goodness and your mercy, Father God, follow me, Father, as I pursue you, Father, as I run hard after you, Lord, as I try to live up to the fact that I've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, and now I'm in the kingdom of the Son that you love, where righteousness reigns, Father God. Lord, help me to live out that reality Lord but also to know that when I fall short father mercy and grace triumphs father I bless you and I give you glory in Jesus name we pray and I thank you father in Jesus name we pray amen and amen God bless you and I'll see you in a couple of weeks <laughs>